situation with the Palestinian refugees as a site for sore eyes to keep this argument all the time, day in and day out, refugees, 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 refugees. Question and answer time, of course. I raised my hand. I said, Mr. Al-Ad, fine speech. You want to build apartments for Palestinians. I admire that very much. Mr. Al-Ad, I have one question to ask you. I'm not interested in your opinion, Mr. Al-Ad. I'm not interested in what you have to say. And why you asked me a question for? I said, I am interested in your feeling. I want to know how you feel. Mr. Al-Ad, how do you feel as a Jew? Yahudi. To give up Judea, Yahuda, to your worst enemy. How does it feel? He said, it doesn't feel good. I said, why do you Jews always do things that doesn't feel good? Because Olmert, in Minneapolis, you know, he's ready to give up Jerusalem. We have to have a state, you know. We have to have this psychotic state. Because the world wants to enforce it. Because if you give the Palestinians land, you ultimately will have peace. If you pull out of Lebanon, you know, finally you'll have peace. When Israel tried to respond to Hezbollah, what happened? Katyusha rockets, missiles, all kinds of things from Qassam rockets all over. And the world stood still. And when Israel retaliated and began to attack the groups of Nasrallah. And of course, civilians died. Civilians always die. Condoleezza Rice said, we must have cessation of hostilities. Yom Kippur war, as the Arabs were winning, the United Nations did nothing. As soon as Israel turned the war around, we had a resolution come out, cessation of hostilities. In fact, the hardest thing is to speak at university campuses. Because at university campuses, everybody wants to carry a placard, you know, blood is more precious than land. Jewish students raise these placards during the peace process, blood is more precious than land. Give land. Well, I could make the same argument. My wife and kids are more precious than my house. Leave the windows and the doors open. Apartheid wall. Jimmy Carter. All this basura that I read in the West that talks about Palestine, peace, not apartheid. Then I listen to Jimmy Carter on the television. He's a Christian, you know, like me. And Jimmy Carter says the Christian fundamentalist movement in America should keep their mouths shut. They shouldn't be active politically. Christianity is not about politics. Christianity is a relationship with God. Okay, then why did you write a book called Palestine, peace, not apartheid? Is that not politics? Ah, in other words, you're allowed to talk about politics, but I am not. I began to ask my family more questions. I wanted more answers. I began to ask my father. I said, Father, you were saved by a Jewish doctor in Jerusalem. Dr. Bernaba in Jerusalem saved your life. You had a blood clot. You had a week to live. And your father, my grandfather, took you to Jerusalem to a Jewish doctor. And you even told me the story that the Jewish doctor saved your life. Do you ever make a dua, a prayer for the doctor that saved your life? Maybe God bless him and bless his children. He says, there is only one prayer we have for the Jews. لَعْنَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ كَمَا لَعْنُمُ اللَّهُ عَلَى لِسَانِ دَاوُدِ كَمَا لَعْنُمُ اللَّهُ عَلَى لِسَانِ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمِ Cursed be the Jews, as they were cursed by the mouth of David, as they were cursed by the mouth of Jesus, son of Mary. Wow! Such appreciation for Hadassah Hospital. Then I went to my uncle Ibrahim. He taught Islamic studies on Al-Aqsa. I said, Cousin Ibrahim, you drowned in the Mediterranean Sea because you didn't want to see the Geverets, you know, the chicks on the beach, and you're religious, you went to a secluded beach, and there was no lifeguards, you drowned. Remember that story? He goes, yeah, I remember that story. 
I said, two of your colleagues with beards went in the water to rescue you. Both of them died. Then a Jewish passerby with a car saw the situation, took a couple empty gallons from the trunk of his car, went to rescue my cousin Ibrahim. And he swam, risking his own life and holding on Ibrahim and saved him back to shore. I said, a Jew saved your life. Immediately I was yanked from the scene by my aunts and my family. He says, don't you ever tell him about that story. I said, why? He doesn't like the memory of him almost dying. He goes, no. He does not want to ever think of a Jew saving his life. What's the problem with a Jew saving your life? After all, they make the best doctors and the best lawyers in the world. I hired a Jewish lawyer. He was phenomenal. I began to, uh, to ask myself, what is really the problem? Because every place I go speak, everybody keeps telling me what is the solution. And the problem is so obvious. You see it on television. You listen to speeches by Ahmed and Nijad. You listen to Nasrallah. You look at the camera and Nasrallah says, وَنُكَرِّرُهَا كُلِّ عَامْ الْمَوْتُ لِأَمْرِيكَ وَنُكَرِّرُهَا كُلِّ عَامْ الْمَوْتُ لِإِسْرَائِيلِ as we repeat it every year, death to America. As we repeat it every year, death to Israel. And the camera turns around and you see hundreds of thousands in the streets in the middle of Beirut crying out, al mawtu li America, al mawtu li America. And the American people still haven't woken up and smelled the hummus. Ahmadinejad comes and he makes a speech about the Mahdi. The blessed Mahdi is going to come. And I am the religious fanatic. Pat Robertson is the religious fanatic because he believes in Jesus coming back to establish peace. We believe in the Messiah that's going to establish peace. It's a defensive war. Because by the time I began to look at the biblical text, because I began to examine things, I began to ask myself questions in America. I began to do research. Was the Holocaust a reality or was it a fabrication? Did six million Jews die in the Holocaust or not? They did. Why did they lie to me? Critical thinking is a problem. Beginning to ask yourself honest questions is a problem. I began to look into songs. I began to go to garage sales to buy Jewish songs. I want to listen to Jewish songs to see how they sing. I'm looking for war songs particularly because as a child when I grew up, all the songs that we listened to from the Voice of Palestine, from the Arab stations, what kind of songs did we listen to? Maybe I can translate some of the songs. I can sing them even for you. I don't have a melodious voice. One of the songs that I memorized when I was a kid, I memorized all the revolutionary songs of Palestine. Sharpen my bones and sharpen them and make them sword. Fill me up as a Molotov cocktail. That's a song. Ya gatilin damkum halali alayna. Wayna antifirru min igabna wayna. Oh Jews, oh killers, your blood is halal to us. Kosher. Where will you hide from us in that day? What day? The day that the Prophet spoke about. When the trees will cry out and the stones cry out, there's a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. And We are a people of blood and march through the night and create bombs out of their flesh. We gatil with all gatil. Fights and continues to fight. Listen to all the Jewish songs. I began to learn a little Hebrew to translate these songs, but I wasn't good, efficient in Hebrew. I lived in Israel all my life, never learned Hebrew. Please, no hecklers. I found only one song. One song that had the word, because I'm looking for the word war, kill in Jewish songs. I found one Jewish song that had the word milchama. I know that word, milchama. Milchama is war, butchery, slaughter. I said, ah, there's the war song. I took it to a Jewish interpreter. I said, I want to know what this song is saying. And he said, sorry to bust your bubble. 
it says that the Gentiles will not learn war any longer from Isaiah. I said, 